This is a KOAA News 5 special presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Zimmerman. We are live at the Citadel Mall in Colorado Springs tonight for our Crime in Community Town Hall. Tonight, we're going to hear from local officials as well as the audience here about questions specifically about crime in our community. Join us for this discussion as we work together to brainstorm solutions to stop crime and violence in our city. This is our home, Colorado Springs. It's one of the most beautiful places to live in the country. The crime rate has been trending down in the last decade. But there are still areas where our city can improve. According to data from CSPD, motor vehicle thefts jumped 33% from 2022 to 2023. And the suspects in many of these cases are kids. And that's really staggering if you think about it. Would you ever have thought that many juveniles are, conduct, are committing those types of crimes on such a consistent basis? Data from police shows around 400 kids were suspected of crimes in the city each month in 2023. More than a quarter of those were suspects in crimes such as assault, robbery, and attempted murder. We've got 10-year-olds that are stabbing people, shooting people, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds doing the same thing. Instances of violent crime have rocked parts of our city, with some members of the community saying enough. These flashes of violence that occur are really just a reminder that we have a problem in our neighborhood that is underlying and being ignored and you know not being addressed properly. Tonight we're at the Citadel Mall where three people have died in shootings in the last two years and left a 13 year old girl paralyzed. When you really look at it, it's not the mall that's doing this to us, we're doing this to us. In the next hour, in a town hall hosted by News 5 and the Gazette, we're focused on solutions to end violence and save lives, as city leaders and members of the community brainstorm ideas and answer your questions. The Crime and Community Town Hall starts now. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this town hall discussing a town hall discussion live from the Citadel Mall in Colorado Springs. I'm Allison Zimmerman, and for the next hour, city leaders and influential members of our community will answer your questions and discuss possible solutions to crime and try and prevent violence in our city. We want to thank today's speakers for participating in this town hall tonight, including City Council Member Nancy Hengem. Can Councilwoman Hengem represents District 5 which covers areas north and east of downtown all the way to Powers Boulevard. This includes the Citadel Mall. She has lived in District 5 for more than three decades. And next, we welcome Dee Smith with the Men of Influence. His organization's mission is to bring local gangs together for open discussions to prevent violence in our community. They've also started a mentorship program in some schools within Harrison School District 2. And also joining us this evening is Mitchell High School principal, George Smith. He was born on Fort Carson and is called Colorado Springs home his entire life. Principal Smith has worked in public education since 2002. And we also want to introduce Colorado Springs Police Chief Adrian Vasquez. Chief Vasquez joined the Colorado Springs Police Department in 1995 after serving in the US Air Force. He was appointed as Chief of Police in April of 2022. And we'd also like to thank Colorado Springs Mayor Yemi Mobilade to our town hall. This is his first four-year term as mayor. One of his top priorities as a candidate was public safety, promising to bolster officer recruitment and training. Before we get started, we would like to thank Deborah Thornton and everyone here at Imagination Celebration here at the mall. Thank you for providing this space for this meaningful town hall discussion. We're excited to talk about some possible solutions and hear from community members tonight. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Here. We're, uh, let's dive right into this tonight. Crime rates go up and they go down. And in addition, the perception of crime rates can vary, but what is the reality? Is Colorado Springs a safe place to live? Are we on the right track in fighting crime? Or do we have a long way to go? Let's hear from Mary Yami Mobilade. Good evening, everyone. It's Thursday evening and here you are 
I, I'm really impressed. I see so many friends and community leaders in the house, so thank you for being here. Um, Deborah Thornton, Imagine Ce and Celebration, thank you for hosting this very important conversation um, as well. Allison, too, thank you. Um, there's a difference between perception and reality. Uh, I want to talk about not what just perception is. Let's talk about re reality. And uh, Chief Vasquez will probably touch on this as well. The, the data is promising. The data is hopeful. The data shows that actually crime is going down. Uh, in some cases, double digits. So that is the good news. That is the city you're living in. And that data is from 2023. I want to be clear. Um, we, we don't quite uh, have the 2024 data yet. Um, that said, we have work to do. Um, the data also shows that we're, we're seeing some uptick in juvenile crime, and Chief will probably talk a little bit more about this too. And there are different factors, and I'm pleased to report that um, as, uh, as what you should expect from your local government is to be proactive and to get ahead of it. And you'll be hearing more about those um, success stories tonight. And please know that um, um, there's part of this work that lives in the realm of city. When, um, my three um, primary functions as your mayor in terms of what I swore my oath to and what I'm held by law and by code is around keeping the community safe, ensuring that um, we have great public infrastructure um, for our residents and also caring for and maintaining for our parks. Um, and then the number of indirect services that I also provide solutions to. But public safety is um, number one. And while public safety uh, lives in the world of um, city government, your local government, please understand that I can't do it alone. Um, I need you. And it's where you see in my 2024 strategic doing framework, the action items, my contract with you for, for 2024 in terms of our deliverables, the fifth pillar is community activation. And that, re that requires our partnership as we try to and work to address um, crime together. Thank you. And we'll get to some of those numbers a little bit later tonight. But Chief Vasquez, safety in Colorado Springs. Is this a safe city? Well, thank you, uh, Ellison, and thank you. I, I also want to start by thanking all the panel members and, and thanking Deborah for, for hosting us. This really right here, what you see in front of you, is, is what it takes to make our city the safest city uh, that it can be. Partnerships with the police, with government, with our school districts, and with our, our, our community uh, that D represents. Uh, this is what we have to do. We have to come together uh, as an entire city and play our roles and ensure that we're doing everything we can for our kids and that we're doing everything we can for, for the safety of our community. Is Colorado Springs a safe city? Yes, I believe strongly that it is a safe city. We are seeing, as the mayor talked about, we are seeing some, some uh, downturn in some of our criminal activity when we look at things like our burglary of motor vehicle uh, thefts. That's down about 1% and we're seeing a decrease in property crimes with the exception of motor vehicle thefts and hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that here uh, in more detail. Um, we are seeing an upturn, as, as the mayor uh, talked about, in our juvenile crime, and I really do want to spend a little bit of time here uh, through the course of this panel discussion talking about what we need to do to make sure that our kids are, um, have a pathway out of uh, criminal activity. But it's not just them. We have a lot of efforts ahead of us around uh, uh, our judicial system, around legislation, uh, and, and there's just a lot that we have yet to do, but we're making great strides, and I think these partnerships are vital to the safety. Yeah. And I'd also like to hear from Councilwoman Hengem, safety of Colorado Springs. What do you think? Well, I concur with the mayor and the police chief, and I think it is a safer city than, um, than many people might perceive or think it is. Um, you know, we get afraid when we hear something or see something on the news when a crime has happened. Understandably, we get afraid. Um, and we need to be prepared and we need to take action, and we are. Um, and there's a lot of community activity that's happening. And I, I will be, I'm, I'm sure, later speaking to some of the um, things I'm really proud of that I'm seeing in terms of the community doing its part as well. Um, but I would say that City Council is also um, really supporting the mayor and the, the police department in numerous ways from a budget. Um, we, we, in the last five years, we um, increased the budget by $47 million in the police department. So there are a number of things that, that the city council is doing um, to really support uh, public safety. Yeah. You all kind of mentioned juvenile crime briefly, mayor in chief. Um, George, let's talk a little bit about 
what we're seeing, I know something you say often is that it takes a village to raise good citizens. How is Mitchell High School in D11 working to keep youth safe and keep kids on the right track? Oh, great question. Um, I too want to extend my appreciation and gratitude for all of the individuals who put this together that host this great town hall. Um, probably long overdue, so thank you. Um, to that question, it does take a village uh, for every human being, every person to grow and, and become the, the productive citizens that we hope for in our community. What D11 and Mitchell High School in particular are doing is uh, we are expecting that all students accept ownership over their own learning. Um, and, and what that does when that happens is it increases agency for those students. Part of agency is having autonomy of choice in their education. And I, and I firmly believe, and so does D11, that when we offer choice to the student and include them in the decisions uh, within education, those students are gonna be more engaged in their, in their education. And um, education then reflects the values that the village has. And um, education is valuable, education is rewarding, but education does not have to look the same for everybody. And so D11 and, and Mitchell High School are embracing that philosophy and we are offering not only traditional pathways, but we're also offering um, non-traditional pathways through CTE, career and technical education. At Mitchell High School, there's an airplane being built in the old car shop currently and so um, I challenge anyone to come and see that for yourself but if a student is interested in building an airplane and getting into um, aerospace um, science we have that availability at Mitchell and there's other options throughout the 11. Uh, once again when students are engaged in learning and in a value system that extends not only within themselves but outside of that through the people who influence them men of influence, uh, no pun intended on that one, but um, you know, those students will stay off the street and, and remain safe. Yeah, and that kind of segues perfectly. D, I know you guys are in schools. Is it choice that is having an impact on student success and preventing violence in our community? What is it? Well, we didn't start off in the schools. So the thing is, is, um, is, is community build and we're gonna talk a lot about partnerships and coming together, but it starts with you. So the first thing that we did as a Men of Influence, we found a few organizations that we wanted to collaborate and partner with. And then after we did that, we reached out to the people who we felt had the most influence. See, the thing about crime is the people that you're most afraid to speak with and the, you're most afraid to talk to, the ones who are causing the most havoc, those are the ones who can control the crime. So the thing is, is for us to reach out to those who we feel has influence over those who are committing the crimes. So you can't stop gang violence without gang members. So what we did was we reached out to the OGs that, we, that, I, was, that I knew, that I grew up with, that I knew that who have evolved, um, their fathers, um, real fathers. Um, they, uh, they have their own businesses and they're living a, a normal life, um, a civilian life. And, um, and I asked them to step up, to, to help take responsibility for our kids, because at the end of the day, these are our kids, and I just don't want people to forget that these are our children that we're dealing with. And we can have all the programs in the world, but if we're not willing to step up for our children, then none of this is gonna matter. And so the thing is, is, is self-accountability. So that's the thing that we were pushing. We partnered up with people within our group, with Story Church, um, Chinook Center, One Body ENT. Our organizations came together to get into these streets and get our hands dirty, which is where the grassroots come in. And I think that that's really one of the main pieces that was missing in all of this, this stuff all of these years. And I want to give the mayor credit for coming down and getting his hands dirty in these roots. And so, um, the thing is, is it took time before they wanted us to come to the schools. Because when we first started, they didn't want us nowhere. They seen us coming. They were wondering, was we finna start some stuff? And so the thing that we wanted to do is make sure that when we are in a place, that you, you see safety, you feel safe. And so 
we decided to come up with our mission and, and our goals and all of us in different organizations coming together for one mission and one goal. And we lead with love. So love, respect, um, integrity, and, and, and consistency is what we move on. And because we were consistent and all we simply wanted to do was have a mass presence back into the community, it attracted the schools. So one thing about getting into the schools is we identify with those schools because we literally was those kids at one time. So the thing is, is we're able to connect with them. The problem is a lot of times is that you're not going to allow a group like the Men of Influence to get into your schools because there's a whole lot of red tape that you have to go through to connect with the schools. But the kids, they connect with us because we connect with them. We don't judge. We, our background is messed up. So it's a judgment-free zone. But what you can see when you look at us is that you can change, you can make a difference. So we didn't start in the schools, and now that we are in the schools, we see that there's a whole lot more work that we can do because that's just the first start. We and Carmel, they, we're in there for a whole hour. They sit down, they listen to us, they mind us. If we tell them to do something, they do it. But as soon as they get out, it's a whole other situation. So it's just consistency. And I know. <laughs> and I know we're going to hear a lot more about these partnerships um, later on in this town hall. Uh, Mayor Mobilade, I want to go back to you. We're here at the Citadel Mall tonight where a deadly shooting took place on Christmas Eve. Community members have been calling for additional security and cameras. What responsibility does the city have when it comes to the safety features in a private business? I mentioned earlier, and first of all, I, I do want to give D. Smith um, a lot of credit for the work that he's doing. Um, we got to catch him young. We got to catch him young. And earlier today, I was at John Adams um, Elementary School talking to third and fourth and fifth grade because of D and One Body NT, their leadership. And it's, um, it's, it's good and humbling also to talk to third and fourth grade and fourth graders and admit that when, you, when I was younger, I didn't always make good choices, you know, and to tell the, and to, for them to hear that from the mayor and to say that I'm a product of good mentoring. I'm a product of, of, of teachers and adults and people in my life that really help um, get me out of trouble. So I just want to give credit to the work uh, that Dee and his team of leaders are, are doing. Um, to your question, Allison, um, uh, it's, it's short and simple. Uh, I take that responsibility, responsibility very seriously. I've mentioned that one of the three primary responsibilities and function of your local government is public safety. So our ability to respond um, when a business or when a resident calls upon us is really top of the list. So when you hear Chief and I talk about the need to get to authorized strength, that's why. When you talk about, when you hear Chief and I talk about the need to um, um, improve our training and have a new training academy with our officers, that's what we're trying to get to so that when residents and citizens call on us, we are there. When people need us in their time of need, you need, you need, you need, you need your government there to, to support, you need your government there to protect, to help. And so, yes, that is on, on the top of my mind. And I, I try not to steal all of, of Chief's um, answers, but I, one of the things that he would tell you is that uh, one of the things we take seriously and we do is that we, we, we listen, we data mine, we just, um, we're not just um, reactive, we're not just a local government that's just waiting for a phone call, when a 911 call, then we respond. Yes, we want to make sure that we, we're able to do that uh, swiftly and with excellence and, and in a way that you trust um, us. But we are also being proactive in the sense of just uh, as we patrol and listen and ensure that we're able to keep our residents out of um, harm's way. But is it the city's responsibility to tell a business you need additional camera, you need additional security? No, not at all. That is just uh, that is government overreach. But if the if the if a private en entity reaches out to us and says, "Can you guide us? Can you give us some ideas?" We will respond. We will help. But we're not going to come and force you to to have cameras and things like that. That's just not that's not part of our job. Yeah, and yeah. I see Councilwoman Hendrum. Well, up yeah, and, here. and I yeah. agree with the mayor. And um, actually, t we are here in the Citadel Mall where. Um, the, the management is, in fact, increasing their security. They've added an armed guard over at certain times. They've added an extra guard. They're working with CSPD on a, 
I'm going to call it hotspot policing. It's PNI. The chief would have to describe what that is, um, but to address uh, some of the safety concerns here in the mall. And by the way, I do just want to say, um, in in terms of this mall and. Um, yes, there have been some things televised and, and horrible uh, things have happened in this mall and not to diminish that. But just this week alone in this space, in the Imagination Celebration, there were 20 um, high school students rehearsing for a Midsummer Night's Dream. There were 20 young adults singing a, and uh, preparing for a show choir. And there was theater across borders rehearsing for educational theater groups going into school and ballet for Glorico preparing for May, uh, Cinco de Mayo. And ju that's just a few of the things that were happening here in this space, in this mall. And there is a lot that's happening in this mall where people actually are enjoying the space and feel quite safe. Yeah. And we know that this is a cultural hub yeah. for our city as well. Uh, police Chief, will you speak a little bit more to that hotspot policing? Yeah, and I'd, I'd first like to, to call out uh, 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 Kurt Rulick, who is the manager of this mall. Um, he's been somebody who has been incredibly supportive in building partnerships with the police department. Not just with the police department, but with business owners, and owners like Deborah. Um, and his willingness to come in, allow the police department to come in, and, and you talked about is it the, is it the government's role to tell, tell a business where to place a camera, where to, to add security. It, it really isn't, but somebody like Hurt and any business owner out there should know that the police department has what they call SEPTED uh, evaluations, which is crime prevention through environmental design. We will come in at your request and we will do an, a complete evaluation of your business, and that's what Kurt has done. And we will tell you, hey, we recommend you put cameras here. We recommend you not have these big rocks right here by the window that somebody can grab and just throw through your window. And they, the, the crime prevention through environmental design is a huge piece of, to your question. We'll do that for any business. Um, but beyond that, the partnerships um, around uh, this type of hotspot policing really is a holistic approach. So you take a place like the mall that has some, some violent acts that happened here, uh, and that has been highlighted by a lot of uh, media and by, by uh, the police department through our response. And you look at partnerships with the people, not just Kurt who manages, but all the business owners. How can we come in and collectively help? What can we do to make sure that we kind of dismantle the networks that allow poli uh, violent crimes in a place like this? Gun, gun crimes are really what it, it focuses on, but really it is a holistic approach to evaluating all the partnerships. Are there some city entities like, for example, can streets help in some way? Can uh, utilities help in some way? Um, what other uh, partnerships can we bring to the table that can really make it less likely that people are going to gather that want to do criminal acts? Um, and I'll just give you one example about it. A mall, for example, is a place where a lot of vehicles are parked, right? People drive here and go to the mall. What do we have a lot of here in Colorado, in Colorado Springs? We have a heck of a lot of motor vehicle thefts to the tune of about 4,383 just in 2023. That's a lot. So how can we deter criminals from coming to a mall and stealing vehicles, as an example? And I promise we will get to that auto theft discussion at some point tonight. Uh, George, specifically, though, Mitchell and the Citadel, longtime cornerstones of an iconic neighborhood here. What does Mitchell community hope to see for the future of the Citadel and its surrounding neighborhoods? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, as a Colorado Springs native, uh, like you mentioned earlier, born on Fort Carson, um, oftentimes before much of the city was developed, traveling from the southern end of town to up, up Academy to the Citadel Mall seemed like a, a big jaunt. Um, and so it was exciting to go to the mall. Um, and so I remember as a, as, a, as a child coming up here, it was, it felt safe. It felt like a community space where we could spend time with one another. I don't remember as a young person being in fear when I was at the Citadel Mall. Matter of fact, if I wasn't here, I was probably across the street at the Dollar Cinemas um, and, and never felt unsafe. And that was even in, in the evening time, right? Um, and so to answer your question, it's let's get back to that. And, and um, I think you need surveillance and you need governmental involvement 
when there's a lack of self-regulation and accountability and consistency in the lives of the young people in particular, because I think that's maybe where we're focusing on here a little bit tonight. But um, if we're holding those young people accountable and they're holding themselves accountable, we don't need the surveillance. We don't need the extra cameras as much. Now we know, you know, reality is we're going to have that. We're living in that day and age. But um, I would hope that as a community, uh, gatherings like this will bring about more conversation more proactive active plan, uh, action planning versus reactive planning um, so that we can enjoy the mall as I remember it as a young person. And are you hearing from students, or maybe parents in the community, that they feel unsafe in this neighborhood? Interesting you ask that question. <clears throat> I oftentimes arrive to Mitchell High School at 5.15 in the morning, starting to get lighter now, um, and leave around 5 o'clock at night. Um, in the wintertime, that's dark and dark. I don't feel unsafe. Um, I told a story the other day, matter of fact, I know just a little bit about real estate, um, and I know when women are pushing babies, people are out jogging, children are walking um, to and from school, um, the real estate goes up, the value goes up. I see that at 5.15 in the morning, oftentimes. I see the children getting off of the school buses by Mitchell, who are elementary students, going to nearby neighborhoods, um, laughing, smiles on their face. Um, a lot of it is a bad narrative of this, of this neighborhood. Okay, and so we have to uh, collectively, and I do want to mention this, uh, I think this is a good time, uh, that media is part of this community, and though, and, and, and though media does a great job of hosting events like this, I would also encourage the media to balance the positive along with the, 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 the tragic events that happen. Yeah. 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 Dee, I know you, your group has made your presence known here at the Citadel. How have your efforts gone here? And can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? Sorry, you've made your presence known here at the Citadel. Tell me a little bit about your group's efforts here specifically. Um, one of the things is um, about having our presence at the, um, the Citadel has just been more intentional now. Um, I believe that, um, I don't really agree that we need to have so much surveillance. I think it's more of accountability with the people in the, in the community, more of a self-policing type of thing because the police can't be everywhere. And so the thing is, is if we're able to, um, to police ourselves and hold each other accountable, and it's really, I just feel like we just need more men in the community to step up and that's really what we're trying to do. Um, and that, that's just basically it, because you have to communicate with these kids, you have to communicate with these families. And the only time we really get a chance to, to communicate with these families is if we're, we're out and about. So one of the things that we're gonna really need to do is get back these resources that, so these kids can gather and to have people like, you know, the people in the community that's doing so much, but we don't have nothing for these kids to go, so they, they're running wild. They don't have no discipline nowhere because they don't have nowhere that they can go to get that discipline. Yeah. And so one of the things is to me is that we need to start providing and making sure that the groups that are out here making these moves and, and having presence in the community have resources to, to have these kids more than just in the schools. Yeah. They gotta have outside of school stuff. I hear both of you talking about this idea of self-accountability, but can you paint the picture for me of what exactly that looks like? Is it, is it specifically mentorship? Or what is the self-accountability? Where does it begin? I just will. <laughs> no, with with, with self-accountability it is for, so the thing is, as far I'm speaking, as far as, far as the one body, e, I mean, one body ENT family with the men of influence, um, we don't point out, we point in. So whenever we find out a problem or a complaint, we try to be the solution to that. So our whole thing is just being solution-based. A lot of the times when you have a relationship with your community, the community is gonna tell you what they want. They're gonna tell you what, you need, what they need. A lot of times before these kids do get in trouble, their parents then already reached out and said, I just need you to do something with my boy. Yeah. 
we, can you can you guys do something? We and, we and we can't all the time. You know, we can talk to them, but there's not nothing. We don't have a, a hub where we can go to like we had back in the day where you have the boys club where you can go to the boys club and have activities and stuff like that. So the thing is, is that we just create them. The problem with creating them is that we're all working and we all have lives and it's, and it's difficult because we don't have the proper funding to do the things that we do. So things get you know, you get lost in the cracks. But the community tells you what they need and you just have to provide those things for them. I'll just add on quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. I'll just add on quickly. Uh, D, you know, sparked a thought. When, when I hear self-accountability, that could be collective, but it could also be individual. And so, you know, again, going back to a value system, let's go back and analyze and identify truly what are the values of this community? And that will help the young people hold themselves accountable as an individual, as a social group, and we can hold each other self-accountable as a collective community if we, if we get back and start to have those conversations. Yeah. And if I could add, I, I would say um, what both of these gentlemen are saying, if I think about all of us, we all need to be accountable for what we do every day when we get up. Do we do what we say we're gonna do? If we need help, let's ask for help. If we make a mistake, let's, let's admit it and let's make a correction. That's true for all of us. That's true for every single person in this room and every single person in this city. And imagine with that, you know, uh, I love what you're doing, um, George, in your school, in that, you know, taking ownership from the inside out. That's how change happens. It's not outside in, it's inside out. And, and that really is a big part to, to all of this. Um, so I, I really commend that. And I would say, um, you know, Men of Influence did a rally right after uh, the murder on, on, um, on December 24th. And they stood up and said that in this mall with 150 plus people and talked about leading with love and, and uh, leading from love and accountability and responsibility. And they're doing that. They are walking this mall. They're, they're making connections. Um, and they got me engaged uh, as a city council person, and I've made um, revitalizing the Citadel Mall in this area a priority as a city council person for the next year. I spent today uh, meeting with four young professionals who are helping me with this, and there's also economic development that we need to be looking at. Um, there is uh, investment in infrastructure that, that needs to happen, education and youth programs, um, acti act activating the space with um, art and so forth, social services, but really community engagement and empowerment is a really significant part. And um, if I could, just since I'm talking. Can I just yeah. follow up with that? Which of these, because it was actually one of my questions, you, you mentioned a lot of these at that same rally mm -hmm. that you referenced here at the Citadel. Mm -hmm. Which one of these is the first step um, well, I think it, it is multifaceted, and I'm kind of working on a lot of them at once, but I think one of the first steps really is that engaging more in the, in the community engagement and empowerment. And so today, brainstormed all the stakeholders that I've already connected with and are already engaged or doing work or I, have, or I know of, um, and then looking beyond that. And how do we bring all of those folks to the table, the, the community, the neighbors, and say, what do we want the parking lot, the tons of asphalt to be that's not asphalt? What would that look like to be activated? Need to work with the management uh, and the owners of the Citadel Mall. This is private property. We can't just tell them what to do. We gotta figure out how does it benefit them and how can they be a part of the success in the community. So um, it's really about hosting those conversations and getting people engaged and excited. It's starting to happen. And I have to tell you, on June, in June, um, starting in June, Zeal Church, 2,000 people every Sunday will not just be attending church at the mall, they're going to be engaged in the mall. Um, Pastor Comier, is, he's here I think tonight. Their church is committed to this community and to serving and being engaged in this community. That is happening and we want more of that to happen. So what I want to do is help just where I can with the, with the influence I suppose you I, I don't have power here I just have some influence but if, with that influence I have how can I help activate those people who are interested and there are many of them so. Mayor Mobilade I want to talk to you You mentioned a little bit of getting to that authorized strength peel back the curtain for us where's recruitment and retention stand chief 
<laughs> I'll take that one, Alice. <laughs> so right now... Uh, we'll give you the real numbers. We'll do, I, will, I, will, I will estimate. <laughs> we'll, we're doing really uh, much better than we have been in the last few years. As, as you've seen across the country, uh, police retention and recruitment has suffered um, over the last years. But as we're starting to, to move forward in our new process, our new hiring process, which is a continuous hiring process, Academy every 15 weeks is starting, our uh, strength now is at 784 out of our 818. Now that's inclusive of the ones that are in the academy right now, but we're starting one every single 15 weeks. Our goal is to get about 32 to 35 in every one of those academies. So I keep telling the mayor, I'm gonna be coming to him in the October academy is my estimate and, and letting him know that I think we're, we're in an over higher status at that point in time, meaning that we've reached that authorized strength. Um, I want to really have conversations continuously with city council, with the mayor and with the citizens to understand that our city, our city is growing very, very fast. And we have to have smart growth with our police department, our public safety officials. So we're not just thinking about today or tomorrow, we're thinking about five years and 10 years. What does that look like? And targeting that. And just before Thank you, Chief. Mayor, uh, yeah, I will, I, I will add to that. Um, we have not had we have not reached authorized strength since 2019, so that's a big deal to be able to get to that. And that's not the when we, when Chief talks about smart growth and as our city grows, um, it's really important. And it's all three arms of public safety. And what I mean is, it's with is with our police officers, also with our firefighters, and also with this third arm of public safety, which is a non-emergent responses. You know, the community and public health. So um, um, t um, programs like the homeless outreach program, programs like the, um, the community response teams, the alternate response team, um, these programs are really important because the public safety landscape is changing. So we have to adapt and change with it. A lot of the, uh, around the third arm is a lot of it, the needs are around behavioral health and mental health. And now we have trained public servants with social work degrees and who are passionate servants who are able to work with some of our most vulnerable population. And also, these programs help reduce the cost of our 911 emergent services. So as our city grows, it's important that we think through how we grow in all three areas. There's a fourth area, but it's actually connected to the first one. And when we talk about how we address crime, it's upstream and downstream. So a lot of our work lives in the realm of downstream, and we do do some upstream work, but when it comes to upstream, that what I mean there is how we prevent crime. So downstream is how we respond to 911 calls. So it's important for us to try to get ahead of it. When um, Commissioner Hendrum talks about the need for the right infrastructure, economic opportunities, uh, programs like Thrive Network, trying to provide opportunities for our residents so that we're not, the, the opportunity for, we just almost eliminate the opportunity, um, the chance for any, any crime to occur. Um, partnership with One Body uh, ENT and some of their work in um, working with our, our young people and the list goes on and on and even out of our police department we have some great programs um, that are happening with the, with the Teen Academy and the Police Chief's Youth Advisory Council and these are high schoolers from across all districts in our region that actually meet with our police chief who serve as advisors to him and his team members and we're able to talk through some of the issues that our young people are dealing with so that that comes our way and we can actually help. So it's a holistic approach when we talk about how we, uh, how we address public safety as our city grows. So you see it grow, some of our response grow in the traditional ways, and you see that we'll be pursuing some innovative ways as well. And before you drove away, Chief Vasquez, I need to follow up with you. you talked a little bit about recruitment, but what about retention of the officers that you have been losing? Well, and that's another important piece of it, right? We want to make sure that we're bringing new, new uh, uh, officers and, and employees into the police department, but what are we doing to make sure the stresses on our officers lessen? Um, and we're also doing a tremendous amount of work in that. So through the course of 2023, we saw that uh, attrition rate um, hit somewhere around seven a month. 
Um, but as we move into this year, I think we're starting to see a lot of our efforts uh, come to fruition. For example, in February, we only lost three officers. That's ex extremely less, right? We've been decreased our attrition, and we're starting to see that through this year, through the efforts that we've made. And a lot of that really is what stresses are on our officers. What can we do to reduce those stresses through mental health, uh, wellness uh, programs? Um, you know, things that are really uh, stressing our officers, for example, are our fight with um, legislation because it becomes so frustrating for officers to continually arrest and rearrest the same offenders over and again. So they're starting to question, you know, why are, why are we here? So really being transparent with our officers about all the things that we can do, not only internally to support them, but quite frankly, this community has been amazing. We have an incredibly supportive uh, community for our, our public safety officials on fire, police, OEM, and, and I'm really proud about the relationships like this that we continue to build because I think that is a critical component to keeping our officers. Yeah, and uh, Nancy, what task is City Council doing specifically to support Mary Emmy and the police department? I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I mentioned the one, uh, the, the budget over the last five years, $47 million increase, and as you know, City Council, it, is this what you're looking for? It is. I have a quick follow-up, yeah. if you don't mind. Is money the answer? No, not entirely. Um, it's one of the things. Um, we have... <laughs> I'll get to you in a minute, Dee. <laughs> um, we've advocated for and supported um, higher salaries for the 9-11 dispatchers, so making sure that we have full strength in 9-11 dispatch. We've ad advocated for and, support and supported moving um, abandoned vehicle management from the police to our um, uh, neighborhood services, which has actually uh, freed up some of the, the uh, the workforce at CSPD to do other things. Um, we had an ordinance to support uh, the CSPD in um, stopping street racing, so that's happened. Um, we've raised the public safety impact fee um, uh, with a projected 40, $45 million over the next 12 years. Um, it's really only 70% of cost recovery for any new development, So, but. But that happened just a couple of years ago, pretty important. And then personally, for myself as a city council person, it is doing things like um, helping uh, to facilitate and connect organizations like Men of Influence with our CSPD and having conversations about how can we um, work more closely together. And look, city council is very, very supportive of our police department. We don't have legislatively we don't have power or authority over the police that's the mayor's role as a strong mayor we can support from a budget perspective we can support from you know having influence and having conversations and, and facilitating conversations um, but those are some of the things that city council is right and, and i do want to add that uh, uh council member Hingham is right but i don't want to minimize that their partnership with my office and with my administration in the budget is really important. When I talk about the third arm of public safety, the community and public health services, mental health, behavioral health, um, for city council and I to be on the same page is really important because this year we increase that budget by 58% so that we can fund more public servants who are able to be out there with the non-emergent services and working with our most vulnerable population. So it's really important because uh, I, for, just so you, how you know how the government works, we, we create a budget, council says, says yes. So we have this partnership back and forth and we have to be on the same page for their yes. And Allison, one more thing, the, uh, yes, that's all very true and that partnership and, and the communication is very important. Another important thing that happened three or four years ago now, um, was the uh, uh, development of LETAC, which is the Law Enforcement Transparency and uh, Advisory Commission. And um, that is really about engaging the public and, and dealing with where there are challenges and, and how, can, how can the community um, be in conversation and support the police, but also you know, where there are challenges, where there's feedback, how do we give that feedback, how do we engage the community? And that is a, uh, that is a commission of council um, but again, it's the mayor who, who uh, has authority over the police, but we try to be in conversation with the police through that Citizens Commission. Yeah. And Dee, you, you had a reaction there. 
talking about the budget. Yeah, I, I, I believe that um, they just they just need to be updated on what's been going on. Money is very important because, <laughs> and that's not the only thing. But the thing about it is, is we've been talking about violence and crime and all of that stuff. They're missing the most important part. And that's the only piece that's been missing this whole time, is the interruption part. The, the, the violence, the, um, the murders don't go down just by itself. I'm going to give you an example. On December 24th, when that young man was, was murdered, right? Everybody in this city, it felt like, is calling me, asking me, what are we going to do? What, what, what next? They're panicking. One of my guys, Dom, he texts and said, oh, I guess the men of influence is going to be working on <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> the thing is, is when stuff do happen, you have to be able to jump out there and get in front of it so it don't go back and forth. The back and forth is what makes the, the murder rate go up. If you're able to stop it or slow it down or at least to get somebody to listen and talk, then that's the first step. The second step is being able to provide something else for them to do. That's the step that we're missing. That's where the money comes in. That's when you have, you have teen nights that you can have. That's when you can have after school programs and stuff like that to where when you say, look, this is not what y'all gonna do, y'all need to do, this is what we can do. We have to put something else in front of them because they don't have anything in front of them no more. And so we go in and we tell them, don't shoot that man. They tell us, okay, now what? And so they're good for another week or two, and they're now out of time. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing for kids as it is for adults. And the thing about it is, because of our background and because of the influence that we have in our respective areas, we, we know what that, what that feel like because we lived it. So a lot of us have, a lot of people that's out here then did a whole bunch of wrong. A lot of people that, if you grew up in Colorado Springs, nine times out of 10, you got into a fight. So you know all of those different feelings and emotions, and you know that if you don't replace it with something, then that, that means that you're gonna just fall back into your old ways. That's why it's important for our organizations that are already out here doing it. You don't have to find nothing else. There's people that's already doing it, that's struggling. We doing that, 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 um, that uh, project at John Adams for those kids. It takes money for us to do that art. It's gonna take money for us to put it on that bypass. It's gonna take money for us to do an unveiling. So how are we gonna get the money? And so the thing is, that's what's <laughs> with it. <laughs> but, and that's, and that's, what's, that's what's teaching these kids, and we are, we're already showing them the way. The thing about the mayor coming, I just wanna thank you for coming. John Adams is the school I went to. That's my elementary school. And by you coming up there, I ain't never seen no mayor before. Ever. So by you coming in there, talking to them, that's one thing that just lets them know. We've seen Obama on TV. They got a chance to see you. You are history. I was talking to those little kids, and I was like, that is history right there. So when your kids is talking about the mayor, and your grandkids are talking about the mayor, you can say, I took a picture with the mayor. I met the mayor. He came to my school. That's something I ain't never had. So that's what we wanted to create with One Body ENT. That's what we wanted to create with the men of influence. We wanted to be able to bring these kind of experiences down to our kids so our kids can see that it can happen. But for right now, we don't have none of that stuff. We're going in and, and, and my guys is just working their tails off, trying to, trying to save something and, and it gets hard because we're doing all of this, this work and fighting and trying to help and trying to save everybody, but our community turns on us too. That's why I understand what you go through. <laughs> you go out there and you do the best that you can because there's only so much that you can do without the resources. Without, the, without those roots being healthy, there ain't no grass top. And I got that from Promise Lee, just drop. <laughs> but you can't, you, can't do, you can't do anything without the roots. So we have to take care of the roots, and that's the thing that people do not take care of. You think that all of this pretty stuff that's going on, we're talking about all of these things, but the root problem is the prevention, the interruption, and resources, meaning money, so that we can provide something for these kids to do, and adults. Yeah. All right. And I do, I do want to bring up other crimes in our community. 
Chief, you've mentioned auto thefts have been a concern for CSPD and truly departments around the state. Last year, police worked with legislators to strengthen auto theft laws, and many communities have seen declines in thefts. But in Colorado Springs, as you mentioned, auto thefts rose in 2023. What's going on here? What's being done about it? So we're doing a lot in, in uh, sort of the, the sphere around uh, motor vehicle thefts. Um, and we'll see, uh, there's, there's going to be lagging numbers. We'll see what the, the statewide reports are. But we're certainly seeing our share of motor vehicle thefts. I mentioned about, I think it was 4,383 uh, motor vehicle thefts just in Colorado Springs reported last year, which was about 1,000 more motor vehicle thefts than the previous year. And part of it is public education. Part of it is making sure our motor vehicle theft and our officers are out there really working those type of prolific offender cases. But even from the perspective of, of uh, you know, educating the community, I'll give you one example. Hyundai's and, and Kia's are the number one motor vehicle theft, uh, or motor vehicle stolen. 38% of those 4,300 motor vehicle thefts were Hyundai's and Kia's, 38%. And there's a simple fix, it, it is going to the dealership and uh, there's a fix so that the TikTok crave that, that allows it to be stolen, that educated everybody, um, makes it much more difficult. That's just one small example. But really, the other piece of it is, the motor vehicle theft is a property crime. The problem is that we have every single day, almost every single day in this city, a, a firearm stolen out of a motor vehicle, every single day. So whether it's a motor vehicle theft or a burglary of a motor vehicle, people are leaving guns in their cars and those guns are being utilized for other types of crimes that are violent in, crime, violent in nature. So there's a lot of education. Part of it is legislation. You're absolutely right. The legislators brought back the uh, 2022 uh, misdemeanor reform bill that put a motor vehicle back in the felony realm. But there's still some hurdles that you got to get over. First of all, if you're a juvenile, our juveniles, we had one juvenile that has stolen 27 motor, vehicle, motor vehicles last year, known to us. Our juveniles are telling us, you're not going to put me, you, there, you have, there's no consequences. You're going to give me a ticket, and I'm going to go and steal another vehicle. We've literally had them telling us that. So there's a lot of uh, self, um, you, know, you know, we have to look internally, and, and self-accountability has been talked a lot about. But Elson, I really want to just mention, I agree 100% about the interruption piece. I want to make sure that we understand that the police department and, and me specifically, I fully recognize the need for these other programs. Dee is absolutely right in that we need to have ways much further down uh, in our age brackets, down in our juveniles, um, to interrupt these kind of crimes and get them involved in other activities. Um, and I'm fully supportive of that. What I'm not supportive of that is the or. We either have to have that or we have to have this. It's an and, it's all of us up here. It's police, we need police, but we also need these other programs. We need SROs in our schools and we need all of our school programs. And the school districts around here are being very, very good about proactive approaches to making sure that our kids have those avenues available to them. Yeah. But just to be clear, I didn't say or. No, I know that. Oh, <laughs> I think we need everything because it, all these pieces go together, and I just said that that one piece was the only piece that was missing. And, and since they aren't funded by the city, you can go to onebodyent.org or just Google it and you can donate if you want to support their work. All right. I Oh, onebodyentklcc.org. <laughs> Or you can go to www.themenofinfluence.com. <laughs> All right. As we get near the end of our program tonight, I want to just kind of go down the line, kind of leave uh, our discussion here as far as what the future looks like. What solutions are we hoping to come up with uh, as we move forward? Bottom line, where do we go from here? Let's begin with you, Councilwoman Henja. Okay. All right. Where do we go from here? Um, I think, I think we have to stop and listen and respond and not react. I think we need to take a beat and uh, notice our own fear and how are we responding to that fear and how are we reaching out and where can we, each of us, every single person who's listening to me right now, ask yourself, what is needed 
here, right now, and am I the person to help meet that need? What can I do? How can I serve? And when we all do that, and we see, uh, we make connections and relationships, and we start contributing and serving in our community, and quit pointing fingers and blaming and expecting the police to do it or somebody else to fix it, then we're going to start seeing a change. Not fast, not quick, not overnight, but I think that's what we need to be doing. And I don't want to rush you all too much, but we have about four minutes left, so try and keep your responses brief. Uh, D, where do we go from um, here? I think that we're on the, on the right track. Um, with uh, it, our leadership, I know that I have to take the time to be patient and understand the process, and I just appreciate you just coming down talking, because I don't think that any of this is going on without the stuff that you've been doing. Um, but y'all been talking about this budget up here, and I feel like that you need to be added in that piece that's been missing in that budget talk because we're not having no more talks like this if we get all these pieces together and we are working working together i'm going to say a couple things the tragedy that happened on the 24th of december involved a marauder graduate he graduated so that's number one. So when they walk through the doors of Mitchell, you know, that's the expectation. So high expectations is where we go from here for everybody. Um, and then I'm gonna leave my comment where I started. There's only one piece missing on this panel, and that is the voice of the youth. Let's continue to have these conversations and let's invite the youth of the community to be part of it. Well, I think I agree with everything, you know, bringing the youth in and paying attention to our school age kids and, and really building partnerships and relationships across our community, being open minded to the relationships and to working together, I think is critical. I know I'm open minded. I know I'm wanting to build these relationships and I'm sure everybody in this community wants the best for, for the safest city. Mayor Mabalade. Let's hear from you. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Um, three things that I'll make them brief. Number one, um, council member and Hanjum mentioned it already. Uh, it's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility when we can't point fingers to others. We have to be the change we want to see in the world. Part of that self accountability is us. What part are we doing? Number two, D is right. Um, they do need funding because just in the same way, you know, as we try to get to authorized strength, we need to pay our officers. And um, and what he doesn't know is I'm 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 working on trying to get some federal funding to support uh, one body entities um, initiative because they 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 do, those things don't happen. Um, but. I can't say anything until the money, I know for sure. <laughs> but um, so yes, um, um, support them. And then, and the third one is, come to City Day Mall. Yeah. It's safe. Come to the City Day Mall. Come to City Day Mall. That's, that's, how we, that's how we, you know, come visit Zeo Church. I mean, just be here. This place is safe. This is a great place to be and come and support. Thank you. big thank you to all of our panelists tonight um, and it's kind of a check-in of where are your sentiments in regards to the neighborhood and moving forward are are we in a place Nancy Hengem we've got a minute left in our program but just you know this is in my district it's a it's a really vital important space in this community it's being used every day it's going to be used every day even more um, I, I feel hopeful honestly I really do I mean yes Things are hard and challenging. That is life, and um, and I, I think we're in a good place. I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate the Gazette and Channel Five interrupting a whole uninterrupted, no commercial breaks. I'm sure you're losing some revenue tonight <laughs> to host this conversation. That's a pretty big deal. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. And again. Um, and I want to give a big thank you to each and every one of you. Deborah here at Imagination Celebration will have a full recap um, of tonight's conversation tonight as well on KOAA.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh,